We will welcome to our numbers the loyal, true, and brave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. And although they may be poor, not a man shall be a slave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The Union forever will boys hurrah down with the traitors. Up with the song while we rally round the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. As the now former head of the IMF rots in a New York prison cell, ironically but lawfully for trying to rape citizens from the third world, sentient people are realizing that the world is reaching a turning point. A wave of unrest is rippling across the planet and it is clear that major changes are in order. Lyndon LaRouche has stressed that we are currently at a point of evolutionary transition in which our species is faced with the option of development or extinction. The system of globalized empire, which has reigned over the preceding decades, is now rotten ripe for collapse, and we are faced with developing the scientific and cultural ideas necessary to bring human behavior back into coherence with natural law. We face the political necessity of reinstating the ideas of a science of physical economy, as developed by Lyndon LaRouche, which will be necessary to see us through this current crisis. The LaRouche movement is currently running six congressional campaigns in key areas of the United States. These include Summer Shields, who is running in San Francisco, California's International Center, a city of 800,000 people with large immigrant populations from China and Russia, this region represents an embodiment of LaRouche's Four Powers program for international collaboration. With its large national laboratories and universities, it is also one of the major centers of scientific research in the United States, particularly in the domain of plasma physics and nuclear fusion. Dave Christie is in Seattle, Washington the former center of American aerospace, and a key city for the development of the North American Water and Power Alliance. With the construction of Nawapa, Seattle will become a major hub on the route across the Bering Strait, connecting Argentina with South Africa. Keisha Rogers is running in Houston, Texas. This is one of the two NASA mission control centers. In Houston, is where we direct all space shuttle missions, International Space Station assembly flights, and where we manage all activity on board the International Space Station. Here, we lead a strategic front to bring back man's extraterrestrial imperative, not simply as an exciting endeavor, but as a necessity for the survival of mankind. Bill Roberts is our candidate in Detroit, Michigan. This is the heart of what was known as the arsenal of democracy during World War II, and is, even in its rusted condition, still the seat of major U.S. industrial capability. This region is to be immediately expanded to facilitate the construction of rail and power systems connected to Nawapa as providing the necessary productive power to back an extended policy for the extraterrestrial imperative. Rachel Brown is running in Boston, Massachusetts. This is home to a dense concentration of educational institutions, also known as the Athens of America. Under the conditions of an extended scientific and economic mission for the United States and the world, this would be a scientific and cultural center of the country. Our sixth candidate, Diane Sayre, is running in northern New Jersey, an extremely important industrial area neighboring New York and shaped in its early days by Alexander Hamilton the first Treasury Secretary of the United States. Our political activity in these six regions involves an intensive campaign for a policy known as Glass-Steagall, which would free the federal government from any obligation to honor debt incurred through financial speculation. This must be done in order to establish the sort of long-term system of investment which would allow the creation of true physical wealth in the form of scientific and technological progress such as that represented by NAWAPA and NASA. To this end, our political organizing also involves an intense educational program for the population 
about why these specific policy measures are necessary. We are working to develop in the population an understanding of economic science as a true physical science, instead of the silly mathematical statistics of free trade, monetarism, and other Wall Street silliness. This requires an understanding of the actual driving force in economic processes and in anti-entropic development more generally. Human creativity. To this end, the educational program involves work both in the classroom and on the streets. In the field, as we call it, we set up booths to educate passers-by and also perform an active and regular intervention into public events and institutions, including the U.S. Congress. We hold weekly classes, which are supplemented by more intense cadre schools a few times throughout the year. The driver of our whole educational system is a loosely centralized research team called The Basement, which works alongside Lyndon LaRouche to develop new and necessary concepts and approaches to economic and scientific questions. The consistent development of classical culture is crucial in this, and education in classical bel canto choral singing by our members is required. Classical artistic composition, poetry, and music most emphatically, is the laboratory in which the functions of creativity are investigated directly and experimentally. Creating classical beauty requires the same creative faculty as discovering a true scientific principle of the universe. It should be no surprise that the greatest scientific thinkers of the past were actively passionate about classical music as the mental source for their scientific inspiration. But the lawfulness behind such spiritual activity is even more than simply inspiring. The study of classical composition is the study of human creative thought per se. And as such, it is the study of that creative process in whose image man is created. The lawfulness of classical composition and moral law is the lawfulness of physical science. Without a developed sense of classical culture, real political and scientific revolution is impossible. The political and economic destruction wrought over the last several decades has been made possible only by the cultural degeneration which accompanied it. The anti-science pessimism of environmentalism was promoted by a culture of mind-deadening repetitive music, drugs, and an obsession with sex and pleasure. Since the death of Franklin Roosevelt, atonal and other forms of degenerate noise have mostly replaced real classical artistic composition. These exercises bear more resemblance to how an insane mind functions rather than a creative one, and were actually designed to induce such insane behavior. People that have substituted such forms of mass entertainment for real classical artistic work have little ability left to make real discoveries in science. The LaRouche Movement educational program involves hands-on work, which includes making astronomical observations, geometrical constructions, singing, and political intervention. In this process, smaller teams have created educational tools, which include in-depth videos and interactive animated websites to facilitate the education of a constantly expanding political movement. Teaching is an integral part of the educational process, developing the teacher's own understanding of the problem by utilizing the educational principle of Gaspar Monge. Teachers are always teaching teachers. Thus, no one is simply a student. The structure is that of a pyramid, where the frontier research represented by the smaller team near the tip is constantly communicated through a network of teachers to a base which grows steadily broader on the basis of political recruitment. The core of the educational curriculum, which we call the narrow path, is the approach that education should take, but rarely does. Rather than read the conclusions of the greatest minds in the past, who produced the breakthroughs on which we rely today, students should instead meet these great thinkers themselves. Discarding the use of textbooks and other questionable secondary sources, the narrow path relies on primary documents. The root of such a curriculum are the dialogues of Plato. Plato's Socrates develops the concept of mind itself as a verb and not a noun. That is, the subject of human mentation is the process of mentation itself, which leads to truth, and not the facts that are gleaned as a result. For example, in Plato's Mino dialogue, Socrates confronts an uneducated slave boy with what appears to be a simple geometric problem. How do you construct a square exactly double the size of another square? Doubling the length of the side ends up quadrupling the square, not doubling it. 
In the end, the slave boy discovers that he must go outside of the nature of the square and bring in a new idea in order to make a square whose area is double. A seemingly similar problem is found in doubling the volume of a cube. This project becomes one of the defining scientific challenges for Plato's Greece. Plato's collaborator, Archytas, discovered that again, one must leave the domain of the cube in order to double its volume. Plato's method of intervention into society, that is, rigorously disclosing the true, unique nature of the creative mind, was revived and developed upon by Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who superseded the insane conflict of religions over a despotic God by demonstrating that not only is the universe reasonable, but that if in fact man is uniquely endowed with that same creative principle of reason which governs the constant development of the universe, then principles which govern the universe, though not directly accessible through our immediate senses, should yet be susceptible to being known by the mind. That is, if in fact humans can discover a universal artistic or scientific principle, then the human mind must be the measure of those principles. That is, man is made in the image of that same creator from whose mind those principles originally unfolded. This idea of a true divine spark kindled the European Renaissance and became the basis of all modern science. Johannes Kepler, an adherent to the method of Plato and Cusa, became the first modern scientist in the true sense of the word. He was the first person to move beyond modeling the way phenomena appeared to the senses, boldly to claim that man's mind was capable of understanding the reasons that God composed the universe as he did. He showed that all attempts at simply geometric models of the orbits, which inherently required imaginary points which everything orbited around, were actually equivalent and equivalently wrong, including the system of Copernicus. Instead of simply modeling, Kepler introduced a truly physical astronomy by asking, what causes motion? His study of astrophysics, based on physical causes, revolutionized astronomy and all of human thought, as he brought first the individual planets under his analytical gaze, and then the system of planets as a whole. In his Harmonies of the World, Kepler investigates harmony as reflected in both sight and hearing, and juxtaposes the two domains to develop a comprehensive theory of universal gravitation, making sense of the motion of individual planets and their functioning as a harmonic system. Kepler demonstrated that man's mind was a thing independent of the senses and designed to resonate with those same harmonies that underlay creation. And in that way, man's mind is capable of using irony and metaphor to understand causes. This is in contrast to Newton's later assertion that God ruled by his arbitrary will, making basic truths fundamentally unknowable. For Newton, space, time, matter, and gravitation are absolute and unquestionable. While, for Kepler, those are simply shadows of universal physical principle, relative rather than absolute. A necessary consequence of Kepler's discovery were several new challenges to future generations, which were to form the drivers of the development of modern science. One of the most important, taken up by Gottfried Leibniz, to unveil the nature of least action and the infinitesimal, led to the discovery of the infinitesimal calculus. Right. So this is what is the shortest path between two points? You may say, a straight line, but now look at the question like this. If a small ball were to roll from a higher point to a lower point, on what path will that ball get to the lower point the fastest? Bernoulli discovered that, in fact, the shortest path in this case is definitely not straight. This principle of least action was greatly generalized by Leibniz with his demonstration of the principle behind the catenary curve. Here is a hanging chain. What shape does it make? It looks like a parabola, but it isn't. This curve, the catenary, is the leading example of a principle of physical least action. The definition of a force-free state defined solely by its singularities and boundary conditions. Faced with the necessity of building the largest dome ever constructed over the top of the Basilica of the Santa Maria del Fiore, Cusa's friend Brunelleschi utilized the least action principle of the catenary later identified by Leibniz. Normal methods of construction would have required entire forest worth of wood just to build the scaffolding. Instead, Brunelleschi decided to literally build his dome into the shape of gravity. Above the basilica, 
where most other people saw only empty space, Brunelleschi saw the least action pathway within Earth's gravity. Thus, by using the catenary as a guide both for the shape of the ribs as well as the stones between the ribs, the principle of gravity reflected in the catenary was wielded by Brunelleschi to build a structure that stands not against gravity, but by means of it. Understanding this curve was a milestone in science. Leibniz, following up on a problem Kepler left to science, the understanding of effects is generated by a continuously operating cause, approached the catenary not as a geometric shape, but as a physical one. This was the true birth of the infinitesimal calculus. The work on Kepler and astronomy extended through Leibniz's work on the calculus leads to Gauss's discovery of the orbit of the asteroid Ceres. This seed crystal of Gauss's work contains the essential elements of almost all of his later work in physics and geometry, including the concept which came to be reflected in the universal principle behind the tensor. Here, least action is examined as an efficient mapping between two distinct spaces, that of the geocentric and that of the heliocentric. The understanding of the lawfulness of this transformation and the transformation it affects in the mind and what stays invariant under it creates the initial pathway to an understanding of the actual ontological character of physical space-time. This language was further developed in Gauss's work on curvature and the geodesics which describe least action in multiply connected manifolds. This early work on curvature paves the way to the work of Bernard Riemann which creates the only viable language with which to discuss the ideas of Albert Einstein and V.I. Vernadsky. In Einstein, we find an application of Riemann's ideas to the abiotic universe, eliminating once and for all the notions of absolute space and time. Vernadsky takes Riemann's ideas to an even higher level in establishing a universe capable of containing within itself the three distinct phase spaces of the abiotic, the biotic, and the cognitive. With respect to the interaction of these three phase spaces, Vernadsky shows that life is an organizing force for the non-living. Despite the fact that it is a relatively weak force, the slow activity of life over millennia has a greater geological effect than any ostensibly abiotic phenomenon. That is, although a single bacterium would probably lose in any immediate conflict with the mountain, it is yet the bacteria which have had the more significant, lasting effect upon mountains. In the same way, although a single unarmed average human probably wouldn't survive a conflict with a large bear, it is yet the humans and not the bears which have the potential to organize all life on the planet, shaping forests and landscapes, while training bears to ice skate. All of this culminates in Lyndon LaRouche's concept of physical economy the science of how mankind organizes the universe as co-creators. This includes our present work on the history of the development of Earth's biosphere and its relationship to cosmic processes. This development is to be understood, in the way Vernadsky understood it, as the process which mankind must revolutionize with its own economic activity, subsuming the biosphere in all of its cosmic extent within the noosphere. The first step in this direction is necessarily the economic policy of Glass-Steagall, reclaiming control over the issuance of credit and re-establishing a system of long-term credit directed specifically at large-scale development projects. Foremost among these will be to take control of Earth's water cycle, with NAWAPA and its sister projects globally. NAWAPA will rescue runoff water from Alaska for use in greening the North American desert shared by the U.S. and Mexico. The technical know-how developed in this project must then be applied in Africa, taming the Congo River in order to green the Sahara and refill Lake Chad, and similar projects must be undertaken for the RLC. A magnetically levitated transportation system will link these projects, bridging both the Bering Strait and the Darien Gap. Such a system of interlinked projects will be necessary in order to situate us for the broader mission of colonizing our solar system a mission which was previously cut short with the assassination of President Kennedy in the United States. This will require the transitioning to higher and higher levels of energy flux density and power sources, first moving to a completely nuclear society, and then using that as a platform for the development of nuclear fusion, 
and then, later, matter-antimatter power sources. It is this process which defines the creation of economic wealth. Wealth is not to be found in either the abiotic or the biotic universe. It is created as a reflection of that very process of successive levels of creative mentation defined by Plato and rigorously defined by Vernadsky. This process of organizing anti-entropic development is a source of all true economic value. Under these conditions of constant scientific development, the concept of limited resources quickly becomes meaningless. Our only limitations are political. It is a question of human will that we either evolve as a species or, as a species, we will die. The survival of the human race, in even the near term, requires us to stop acting like animals and to return to the path of science marked out by our narrow path, and requires a deep change in how people think. This means a return to classical artistic composition and a study of how the human mind acts creatively. With this as our cultural foundation, the LaRouche movement represents a small but powerful political force in the U.S. and globally. We have youth offices all over the United States, as well as in Germany, France, Mexico, Argentina, Australia, and we operate politically in some form in almost every part of the world. Our website gives us the ability to be everywhere at once and provide immediate political and educational orientation, as well as provide educational ammunition for others every day of the week. These times of crisis are ripe for the sort of revolutionary changes which our six candidates, under the leadership and guidance of Lyndon LaRouche, are leading. The current system of globalization and free trade has reached the natural end of its unnatural life. As whole nations fall into disrepair and a mass strike ferment spreads across the globe, exploding in a series of seemingly isolated uprisings, it is very clear that the survival of the human species depends upon us making an evolutionary leap of the form indicated here. We will welcome to our numbers a loyal, true, and brave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. And although they may be poor, not a man shall be a slave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The Union forever were all Up with the song while we rally round the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom.